people said. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Ask an Addiction Specialist. I'm Dr. Bob Weathers, and I'm here with my friend. Odie Martinez. All right, great. It's great to be here. The Bob and Odie Show. <laughs> um, to quickly, by way of um, introduction, welcome back to uh, my background is in psychology. I'm a professor of clinical psychology here locally. My friend. Uh, locally is in Orange County here at California Southern University. And I'll, I also work uh, as a recovery coach uh, for my uh, individuals and groups, and uh, including in my work for Beginnings Treatment Centers. I'm just coming from their location in Santa Ana. They're one of our co-sponsors for, for today's uh, presentation. I'm very grateful to Beginnings. Very grateful to our producer in the studio, Austin Armstrong. He co-produces with Odie. They're both men of many talents, wearing many hats. I'm really happy to be here with you all today. I'm just landing from my, uh, a group that I just led today at Beginnings, and I want to start today with a quote that was shared with me. You know, it's not that typical that you hear something that you just never heard before. This was a quote by Albert Einstein, hmm. and one of the group members mentioned it, and I intend to weave in what this quote is about. I actually had to bring it up on my phone <laughs> to read it to you all, but I want to share it with you. Uh, it'll give you, a, and I'll tie it into the direction we're headed today. Maybe you all are aware of this, and I just missed school the day that, that, that they <laughs> shared this. Albert Einstein, he said, Everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Have you ever heard that? Similar. I'd never heard that yeah. before. I'd never heard that before. If you judge a fish by yeah. its ability to climb a tree, which is to say you judge it by something it's not good at, that hapless fish will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Today we're going to be talking about our, uh, our various kinds of intelligences that we have, one of which gets tapped into, into school, which is academic intelligence. Mm -hmm. I'm coming fresh from a group where we listed a whole bunch of different kinds of intelligences on the board, and we'll be talking about that later today. And I want you to remember that story about the fish, is that, uh, that none of us have uh, intelligence intelligences across the board. Some of us have certain gifts, or as, as Einstein said, we have genius in certain areas, and other areas are, are deficient and needing a little bit of attention. And the goal today is to help us to focus in a positive way on what it is that we're good at. So mm -hmm. that's where we're headed today. Thanks. Last week we talked about shame and what it feels like in our bodies and why that's relevant to any conversation about recovery from addiction. And this week we're going to be looking at the antidote to shame in our bodies, which is how do, how do we feel good about ourselves, uh, like I said, in terms of our individual gifts or genius. So we'll be, we'll be looking at this as uh, under the title today of Holistic Treatment with a Map. There's a lot of conversations about holism in, in uh, the treatment world uh, of addiction, that is body, mind, spirit, some kind of variation on that. We're going to take that very seriously today, so that's a little bit where we're headed today. Uh, I'd like to invite all of you to interact with Odie and me. Austin is handling all of your questions and comments as they come in, and he'll direct them to us, and we'll do our best to respond to them. So if you're uh, watching us on multiple platforms today, Austin says, <laughs> uh, be sure to uh, use the chat function to, to reach out to us, and we'd love to interact with you in real time. Uh, also, if you have friends that are interested, refer them to any one of our sites where we're located right now. YouTube comes to mind, Beginnings Treatment Centers, Ask an Addiction Specialist uh, podcast through uh, the Facebook group, etc. So thank you for joining us, and, and uh, let's start off. Let's start off with a story. Uh, I get up in the morning. I don't think you know this about me. I get up in the morning. Well, maybe you do. I get up in the morning early. I get up in the morning typically early and spend about an hour in what I call quiet time. It's just it's, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, what I do to kind of get myself set for the day. Mm -hmm. And then I leave the house early in the morning and generally go swimming early in the morning. There's a community mm -hmm. pool nearby, and I'm usually there by about 7 o'clock or so. Well, there's a man at the pool. His name is Mike. He gave me permission to tell this story, including his name. <laughs> There's a man at the pool named Mike who hands out the towel. So after I swim for a half hour or so, I go get my towel, I dry off, and I head back home and shower and then kind of get started in my day. Well, this is kind of a morning ritual for me. I do this, and it's, it's a good way to kind of get myself woken up as well as kind of spiritually centered. Mm -hmm. Yesterday morning, for whatever reason, Mike was there, and I was feeling grateful when he handed me my towel. <laughs> And uh, we know each other by name, but we've never interacted. And I said, Mike, I want to thank you for being here at this ungodly hour of the morning. Because he's there every, every, uh, every day at 7 o'clock, mm. handing out towels. Yeah. 
and I and it, I took it even further. I, I said I said, you know, I, I my work is with addiction. I work with individuals that are in recovery from addiction, mm -hmm. and I want you to know that I think that what you create here for me, which is an opportunity to swim. And swimming has almost become kind of a prayer time for me. It's a, it's a really mm -hmm. uh, a powerful uh, way to start the day. Is that I said, Mike, you contribute to my work each day, and I just want to give you a gratitude for that. So thank you. And uh, I, uh, it opened the door. He, mm -hmm. he said, he said, uh, oh, so you work work with uh, individuals in recovery from addiction? I said yes. And uh, uh, we talked a little bit about it. I said I'm in recovery myself, and I said I really love the work I do. Mm -hmm. And we kind of left it at that. And actually, it was at the beginning. He handed me out. He gives me the, today. He gave me my towel before I swam. I mean, yesterday, I swam. And then I came back afterwards, and he said, "Can I talk to you for a second? I said, "Sure." And he said, "He said a little bit less than a year ago, the day after Christmas, my sister—I should say Mike is about ten years younger than I—so mm -hmm. his grown sister, she passed away the day, day after Christmas last mm -hmm. year, uh, owing to addiction, long-standing addiction." Wow. And it just dropped the conversation into a whole new place. And I said, oh, Mike, I'm so sorry. And we talked about that together. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I, I was very struck by it. And so I left uh, yesterday thinking of Mike. And um, in fact, I told him, well, I told him, because I, I saw him again this morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I went back this morning. <laughs> there's Mike, there's the towel. And I said, I've been thinking of you since yesterday, Mike. And I said, I really appreciate you reaching out to me because uh, it's isolating. Mm -hmm. Not only if you're if you're dealing with recovery from addiction, but it's isolating to be in a family uh, of somebody who's uh, dealing with addiction, much less somebody who's passed away owing to addiction. Mm -hmm. And we talked some more. We talked some more. So we've we've struck up this relationship now. Um, and one of the things I talked to Mike about yesterday, and then again today is uh, I, I mentioned a few statistics to him, believe it or not. They were on my mind at 7 o'clock in the morning. I want to share some of those that I shared with Mike yesterday with you today. And, and I'm labeling this uh, 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 a conversation about shame and stigma this week with Mike because I, I tend to focus less on it, Odie. I tend to focus because I work directly most of the time with individuals who themselves are in recovery. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this is somebody who's not in recovery, but his sister was in and right. out of recovery and died. Mm -hmm. And so it brought up for me uh, an awareness of a few things. One is that I shared, with, I shared with Mike, I said, I don't know if you know this, Mike, but a quarter of adults in America uh, suffer from addiction to a substance. Mm -hmm. If you include alcohol, nicotine, and other psychoactive drugs, excluding um, caffeine, mm -hmm. if you include those other drugs, uh, one out of four people are addicted. It's very common, but I said there's, I did share this with him yesterday. More, more uh, striking to me is that two out of three of us have a family member who's addicted. Mm -hmm. It's that common. So you and I, we have like one degree of separation. If, if you or I isn't himself in recovery from addiction, we typically have a loved one who is, mm -hmm. who's either currently actively addicted or in recovery. But the more disturbing statistic, which I also shared with Mike, is I said two out of three people that have a family member that's addicted won't talk to anybody about it outside the family. Mm -hmm. And Mike was very touched by that because he said, you know, I don't talk to anybody about this. Mm -hmm. So his sister died coming up on a year ago, and he said that his mother has been just, uh, can you imagine what this is like for a mother of a grown adult yeah. to lose her child? Uh, but neither one of them have really been able to talk about it. When I saw him today, he used a word that came to me yesterday on my own thinking about it, and I loved it. He, he said, Bob, it was cathartic talking to you. He was able to let off steam, ventilate feeling, and he wasn't carrying it inside himself anymore. And I told him today, I said, Mike, you're going against the norm then because two out of three people won't talk to anybody outside of a family about it. And so, Mike, this is for you that we're talking about it openly. I was grateful, and I don't know what it was that led me to share my work, much less my own being in recovery, but it seemed like it let down the guard so that we could talk to each other more right. honestly. Does that make sense to you? you no, know, yeah, that's very nice to have. Uh, I think we've talked about it before of the difference that it makes when we talk about our experiences with addiction yeah. and just how we can have that connection with uh, with even strangers. Yeah. Just yeah. being vulnerable that way. Yeah. It's In fact, it's interesting you use that word because Mike and I barely knew each other. We were virtual strangers mm -hmm. as quick as as recently as yesterday morning. 
at 6.55. <laughs> and by 7, we'd moved into a new level of relationship. And by today, uh, there was a warm handshake at the end of the conversation. And I know that we've become friends in a very, uh, in a very uh, sacred place in terms of his feelings for his sister right. and the loss of her and uh, our being companions in that. He's not mm -hmm. alone in that. Yeah. I even told him yesterday as I was leaving, I said, I want you to know this, Mike, is that this Christmas... Uh, uh, and the day after Christmas, I want to make sure that you're not alone, and I want to make sure to make market by just making myself available as a friend to him this mm. year, so that he's not alone on the, on the first anniversary of his sister's loss. Right. We talk so much in our podcasts about shame as a barrier to recovery, how it it uh, it isolates us from others, it isolates us even from our being uh, honest with ourselves. There's a tremendous amount of societal stigma around addiction. And in fact, I think this conversation with Mike made me aware of how much stigma or, or uh, kind of hiddenness there is about even addiction in our families. Mm -hmm. There was a study done a few years ago at Johns Hopkins University that looked at uh, all of the different categories of so-called mental uh, diseases or mental illness, mm -hmm. including anxieties and depressions and uh, 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 various kind of psychotic thought disorders and so on. And the, the question was, which one of these has the most stigma attached to it? And at the very bottom of the barrel were the addictive disorders. Mm -hmm. And so uh, societally, we tend to look down on those the most. So it's hard if you're, if you're addicted yourself not to judge yourself. Mm -hmm. It's also uh, quite simple to find people that will judge you for that. It's a very kind of a, right. a, 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 a knee-jerk reflex. And so it's refreshing when there can be an honest conversation where there is no judgment. Mm -hmm. I was really appreciative yeah. of that. By way of quick review, and then we're going to try an exercise here in just a few minutes, and then Odie and I are going to debrief after that exercise. <laughs> I want you uh, to recall our, our definition of shame just in the last week or two as we've been talking about shame in our physical bodies. We make, this, uh, we, 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 we make a distinction, but it's almost like two sides of a coin. That shame, rep shame is the feeling that comes up when there's a threat to my social acceptance. Well, think about Mike. Mike's sharing with me something he's not sure if I'm going to judge him uh, he's not going to sure he's not sure if it's okay to talk about having lost a sister to addiction and he uh, was courageous mm -hmm. to trust to trust yeah. to move against that but shame would keep us in our private world and not willing to uh, not willing to share and I could tell that as we talked yesterday that it was relief for him to be able to disclose it and for me to actually feel his courage yeah. rather than 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 to, to uh, reject him. The flip side of shame, if, if a threat to social acceptance is one aspect of shame, another aspect is any threat to our self-esteem. And uh, like I said, it's been very hard for him, very mm -hmm. hard for him having yeah. lost a sister. It'd be one thing to lose somebody to a physical disease mm -hmm. that is more um, uh, uh, universally supported, you know, and I can think of different diseases that one might have or that one might die from. Mm -hmm. But to say that one has lost a family member to addiction is a different, it's a different story. Yeah. And so he was able to rise through that and not get caught in either my rejecting him or not get caught in feeling so bad about himself that he can't share it. So mm -hmm. um, we've also made a distinction. This is actually a more common sense distinction between shame and guilt. Do you recall that? Yeah. How, how would you make the <laughs> distinction, Odie? I'm going to put you on the spot here. Yes, <laughs> please do. Uh, so shame is I am something bad. Yeah, yeah. Guilt is I did something bad. Yeah, yeah. We made that distinction in today's group, mm -hmm. very, very same distinction, and there was an individual uh, 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 young man in the group who said, Dr. Bob, how do we address shame? How do right. we lessen shame in our lives? And we've taken lots of approaches to that here in our conversations mm -hmm. for sure. Um, and I encourage you all to review, Austin will be happy to hear me say this, I encourage you to review all of our podcasts that we've had over the months that, that address uh, multiple uh, avenues towards uh, managing and reducing shame in our lives, uh, uh, generally and also specifically, generally in terms of how shame is a universal for all of us, specifically in terms of addiction and how it is that, as I've said before, the poor get poorer, mm -hmm. is that individuals that are prone to shame are more vulnerable to getting addicted, and then the addiction itself leads to more shame, and so then the so you can see the vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. So, 
Um, we've taken lots of different approaches to that and I encourage you to look at that. Today we want to try a different approach and this is the approach, this is how I answered the, the gentleman uh, today. Uh, I said, let's, let's try a different approach today. Mm. I want to introduce for just and make a few comments about what's referred to as positive psychology here. It's not something that we've talked about explicitly in our conversations and then we're going to do an exercise that will be an example of how you might apply positive psychology uh, to this phenomenon of shame. Okay. Let me tell you a quick story. When I started graduate school those years ago, I'm coming up on next year will be 40 years ago I started graduate school, so it's wow. a while back. I went down into the bottom stacks of the library. They had all of, all of the uh, journals, all the different psychological journals and books. And I was, I believe I was in my first year of graduate school and I wanted to see if I could find a book that dealt with psychological wellness or um, health. In other words, what would be the goal of, of uh, well-being? And I did find one book out of a library of thousands of resources in psychology. I did find one book, and even at that point, that book was old. It was written in the 1950s. I found one book on psychological health in the <laughs> library. Now, if you ask me, could I find a, a book on psychological disease, there were dozens of books on every different kind of disorder imaginable. Mm -hmm but only one book that I could find on psychological health and well-being. Mm. And that's changed over time. It, that's yeah. not that long ago that that was the emphasis. And still, if, in, if you get training, for example, My Discipline is Clinical Psychology, most of your coursework is on what's referred to as psychopathology, what goes wrong psychologically. Mm -hmm. And there's something about that that makes sense, but if the only goal of our lives, Odie, is to get rid of psychological problems or disorders, mm -hmm. it seems like a pretty empty life to me, you know. On yeah. your deathbed you say, well, I got over my anxiety. Well, uh, congratulations. That's, that's <laughs> scary thought. It is. It's <laughs> as limited as that there's got to be more to life than yeah. just not being ill. Absolutely. And what would health look like? Well, in the last 20 to 30 years particularly, there's developed in psychology what's referred to as a positive psychology, which is a response to so much for lack of a better word, negative psychology. Mm -hmm. And I want to say just a few words about positive psychology um, in terms of the work that I do, because I'm aware, very much, been very much impacted by positive psychology in the work I do as a recovery coach. There are a few things about positive psychology that take a different stance than you typically would expect from traditional psychology. One is that it tends to be, in terms of uh, the, the coaching I do, it tends to be very collaborative. Mm -hmm. So. You come to me and you expect for me to know things, but I don't, I don't, there's not a power hierarchy where I tell you what to do, much more than we're kind of mutually solving problems together. Mm -hmm. So there's a very different vibe. I grew up with a father who was a physician who was trained in the 1950s, mm -hmm. and, and my dad, bless his heart, definitely grew up in that very traditional thing that the doctor was God. Mm -hmm. And there was a bit of that in my own training in clinical psychology, you mm -hmm. know, uh, that, that, you know things, you know how to diagnose people, you know how to uh, give treatment plans right. and, and tell people what to do, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and this, this, this approach that comes from positive psychology is a very different approach. Rather than a kind of one up, one down type of approach, it's very much on a level playing field. Mm -hmm. It's to really look at you as having resources and that first quote that we said about your genius mm -hmm. is looking at your gifts. So that's one of the, one of the aspects of a positive psychological approach. Here, here's another one is the focus is on your strengths. Remember how I told you I went to the mm -hmm. library and I couldn't find any books on psychological well-being? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, what about people's strengths? Does it make sense to emphasize those two? Mm -hmm. So you can rid me of all of my, uh, all of my liabilities, but we haven't done anything to really kind of get on board my strengths or my assets. Mm -hmm. And so positive psychology tends to focus more on assets or strengths. Mm -hmm. A third thing that positive psychology does is, uh, in fact, this has come up for me over the years when people find out that my my uh, doctorate's in psychology and the work that I do, they'll go, oh, are you gonna tell me all about myself? Are you analyzing me? Can you, uh, can you help me understand how my childhood affected how I am right now? Those mm -hmm. kinds of assumptions that I'm always analyzing people. The truth is I'm not always analyzing people. Right. But one of the things that positive psychology does that's different than traditional psychology is there's much more focus in the coaching work on the here and now. Mm. And it, I, I could just go back to the group today is that, uh, as we're discussing whatever's going on, I'm asking people, how did, how did you feel with the exercise that we just did? How, did? how was it for you to assert yourself right now with me? Is you're constantly checking out the here and now as much as we are asking about what happened when you were three? 
There's value to that, but there's also value gained in the here and now. So there's much more of a present focus. Right. Uh, and then, uh, then fourthly, what I want to say, and it's implied in the other dimensions of positive psychology, it is a non-pathologizing psychology. And all I mean by that, you remember how I said that most of my training in clinical psychology was studying psychopathology, what goes wrong. This is very much a non-pathologizing psychology. So I can remember over the years I've had clients look at me and say, well, how, do you, how are you diagnosing me right now? And the honest truth is that I don't typically think of people in terms of diagnoses. Mm -hmm. If we want to do that, I can pull the manual off the shelf and we can look at it. Right. But I don't like it when people diagnose me. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and why would they like that? And so this is a non-pathologizing -patho orientation to, okay. to, to, to the work. And so that's positive psychology in a nutshell. Right. Looks like somebody has written in a comment here. Ah, oh, this is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much. This person shared, I see all your podcasts about unshaming as creating safety for everyone to heal from shame. Thank you. That's, that's my wish too. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this person goes on to say, I just learned that the number one thing needed to shift to a more relaxed healing nervous system is a sense of safety in our environments and relationships. Yeah. In fact, what we just mm -hmm. talked about from positive psychology, I think it really enhances the feeling of safety in the moment to realize that this person isn't judging you, mm -hmm. isn't pathologizing you, isn't trying to analyze you for what happened in your past. That's something that you can look at, but right. right now it's paying attention to what's going on in the relationship right now and is much more interested in your strengths that you bring to the table uh, than necessarily uh, your weaknesses or your, your deficits. Mm -hmm. And that the focus is on collaboration, so there's, there's mutual respect. But finally, the person says, oh, so thank you. You're welcome. For Bob and Odie, thank you <laughs> for creating safety on a social level for this important work. I do thank you, Odie. Yeah, yeah thank you as you, well. Yeah, yeah. You've, risked, you've, risked, <laughs> you've risked being vulnerable here, and mm -hmm. that's one of the ways that we can model this is creating a safety for each other. I think it yeah. actually is what happened yesterday with Mike. For mm -hmm. me to lead by saying, this is the work that I do. I'm grateful to you, Mike. And by the way, I am uh, in recovery myself from addiction. Mm -hmm. it, set, it set the tone. It, it, a half hour later, he's sharing with me a story that would never have come up. It hadn't come up in the several months up to now. So, yeah. yeah. yeah I think it's, it's vital to kind of have that safety in mm -hmm. not only relationships, but in your environment. Um, this past weekend, I got back from a trip from Colorado with uh, my wife's side of her family. And just uh, just interacting, you know, with with a, with an environment that's outside of your yes. normal seat yeah. of what you're used to, uh, just kind of from the outside in, looking at like different interactions of of uh, certain relatives, yeah. and seeing that um, you know they'll share something with you, but they might not share something with someone that's close to them interesting but yeah. just seeing that just seeing the the positive impact that it could have yeah. if you were just to you know what don't just share it with me yeah. share it with that yeah. other person yeah. as well yeah um yeah. just tell the big difference that i could that it could make yeah yeah you know what it's I mean? ironic isn't it yeah it's it ironic. is it's it it's, it's saddening but at the same time it's yeah. it's get a sense of hopefulness as well because yeah. at least it's a step towards the right direction of yeah. like well you're yeah. sharing it with me hopefully you'll get to a level where yeah. you're comfortable to to share it with with others as well that's so, a good way to look at it yeah. i like that it's almost like practicing i'm going to practice with you because you're mm -hmm. not directly in my blood family let's say and right. then if i can have a successful experience if i feel safe in the words of this individual if i feel safe maybe i might try risking being vulnerable mm -hmm. <coughs> with somebody that there's maybe more skin in the game owing to the fact that we're family. Yeah, exactly. I think it's a part of like my recovery too that makes me hopeful. <laughs> you know, so having so having go th having going through it. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, and yeah. just seeing how it affected me, like eh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. 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 I, uh, I commend you, yeah. and I I feel similarly committed to this too. And many of our listeners are involved in various self help support groups. Mm -hmm. Where vulnerability is the order of the day, where, yeah, you're, exactly. where you're actually invited, uh, you're expected to share 
vulnerably. And at least for me, and maybe for you too, mm -hmm. at least for me, that was very challenging uh, mm -hmm. early on. Oh, yeah. I didn't think it was possible. And then over time, it becomes more and more familiar. Mm -hmm. So much of the work that I do in leading groups invites people to, to share vulnerably and oftentimes things that we don't share mm -hmm. with those closest to us. We're going we're gonna to do an exercise right now that gives us a chance to share something that we, we may not share uh, often, except this time we're going to not look at things that are uh, vulnerable and kind of our so-called shadow. We'll be looking at things that are in the spirit of that initial quote about genius, mm -hmm. things that are our gifts. And so right. uh, we'll be doing, what we're going to do right now is about a 10-minute meditation. I, enjoy, I invite you to join us. We'll do a brief uh, mindfulness uh, 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 exercise to kind of get ourselves into a relaxed place. And then we're going to do a mm -hmm. gratitude uh, meditation that gives us a chance to look at maybe a dozen different things in our lives mm -hmm. for which we might be grateful. So rather than being ashamed of it, it'd be like something that you'd want to celebrate. And uh, we'll do the exercise. And then I have, got, have some material um, uh, that I want to use to unpack that along with Odie and I talking about our experiences. So join me on, a, on, a, on an adventure right now. It's really an adventure into positive psychology. And I will be tying this into the title for today's presentation, Holistic Treatment with a Map. I'm going to make that map more explicit after we do the exercise. So if you'll join me in the exercise, okay? Um, uh, if, you're, if you're looking in right now, I invite you to close your eyes or maybe just lower your eyes just to reduce distraction. And I'll guide us through an exercise. And uh, just use what fits for you. Use what fits for you. Uh, uh, but I'm hoping to provide enough anchor points that you'll find your way with it. So let's take a deep breath. And release that when you're ready. Another deep breath. And release. On the next breath, deep breathe in deeply and feel feel your abdomen rise with the breath. And as you let it out, feel your abdomen settle or fall. Pay attention for the next couple of breath cycles of the rising and falling of your abdomen. The in-breath rising with the out-breath the falling. We're in a very quiet environment here. You may not be. So on the next couple of in-breaths, if you notice any sounds, just gently Register them and let them let them sit on a shelf and bring your attention back to the breath. We want to focus, if we can, on the rising and falling of the breath. Also, you may have inner noise in terms of thoughts. And as a thought arises, see if you can catch it before you follow it. That is, just label it. Thinking, thinking, set it on a shelf, and then come back to the rising and falling. Let's try that for a couple of breath cycles. Breathing in, breathing out. Rising, falling, thinking, thinking. After the next deep in-breath, as you let out your breath, allow your body just to settle down. If you're sitting, sit feel gravity pull you into the chair perhaps you're lying down the same just allow you feel your weight of your body just allow yourself to go limp so. just release and relax on the next two full breath cycles starting from your feet gradually working up to your head trace across your body and Make note of any differences in temperature from cool to warm. For example, your extremities might be cooler. Any exposed skin might be cooler. Just notice the difference between cool and warm. A couple of breath cycles, so just take your time. Get another deep breath, feel the rising and falling of your stomach.
On the next two breath cycles, see if you can locate your heartbeat in your chest for right now without putting your hand on your chest. So see if you can feel your heartbeat from inside. It's very subtle, but give it your best shot. And a couple of breath cycles for that. Now put your hand on your chest and feel your heartbeat directly. Breath cycle, just feeling your heartbeat in your hand. Next, lower your attention to your stomach. <clears throat> Notice what you feel right now in your digestion. Are you uh, full? Are you hungry? Maybe you've got a little bit of upset or indigestion. Just make notice, notice of what you feel in, in your stomach. On the next two breath cycles, starting from your head and working your way down to your feet, Scan across your body for any muscle tension, uh, any aches and pains, for example, in your joints, or maybe the lack of any of them. Just make note of what you notice as you slowly scan and take your time, two full breath cycles. Next, a breath cycle. Let's do two breath cycles, noticing what you hear. I'm in a very quiet space here. Even Austin is quiet with his fingertips. <laughs> no typing right now, I guess. But there will always be some sounds. If you hear a sound, notice the silence between that sound and the next sound. So you can be in a noisy environment and still detect silences between sounds. So a couple of breath cycles, just noticing what you hear. Next, we're going to move into gratitude. So stay with your eyes closed. I'll talk us through a good number of things that you might be able to locate gratitude uh, in your own life, that you can locate some gratitude that applies to them. <clears throat> and as I said before, if something doesn't apply to you, that's fine. There'll be something else that comes up. So I'm going to start with gratitude related to the physical body and go from there. So since this is in the context of our podcast series, Ask an Addiction Specialist, and we talk so much about addiction and recovery, let's start with this. If you've been addicted and are sober today, gratitude for sobriety. Just to allow yourself to feel gratitude for your sobriety. If you're healthy today relative to how you felt in the past, if you're relatively healthy, Gratitude for health. If you've had a chance to exercise your body in the last day or two, or intend to do that later today or tomorrow, gratitude for physical exercise. If you've eaten well over the last day or two, or today, or tomorrow, plan to. Gratitude for healthful diet. I 
I worked with so many individuals who are very early in recovery from serious addiction, and many of them have uh, sleep difficulties. So if you've been able to sleep better or sleeping well uh, these days, uh, you'll know what I mean when I say gratitude for sleep. Finally, with the physical body, anything that you do that's non-addictive, I work so much around recovery, uh, uh, anything that you do that helps to calm, calm yourself, that helps to manage your anxiety or your stress, um, this side of resorting to addiction. For some people it's working out, for some people it's listening to music, uh, hiking, uh, other people it's meditating like this right now, but just gratitude for anything that you use that's creative and productive for the sake of self-calming. Your body appreciates it. <laughs> Next, in terms of physical security, if you have a roof over your head and can count on your next meal, gratitude for, for, um, for that, gratitude for physical security. It's not a given for so many people on the planet. It's not a given for many people who are in recovery from addiction who have been homeless. And while we're on the subject of security, gratitude for people in our lives who have stuck with us through thick and thin, particularly in the context of recovery, but it doesn't have to be just that. Through the thick and thin of your own life, who, who are you able to count on and to express gratitude for these people that are securely in your corner? Speaking of relationships, <clears throat> gratitude for close friendships and intimate relationships where we're able to share our souls and our lives with others. So if you have someone that you're able to do that with, a loved one, gratitude for intimacy, uh, emotional, spiritual, uh, and sexual when that's applicable, uh, intimacy with another. Gratitude for these companions in our life. We started off today talking about gifts. Think of something that you either like to do and or you're good at. Think of something in terms of, of gifts that you've been given. This is an opportunity to express gratitude for those gifts. And then finally, <clears throat> to survey your life for your sense of meaning or purpose. So many individuals I work with are just beginning to find a purpose in sobriety to really recover their lives and make a difference in the world, to touch someone else's life. So give yourself a chance to think about that and to feel into that and to express gratitude to the extent that you have a reason for getting out of bed each day, uh, a direction in your life, something that you value. And we're completed with the exercise, so you can open your eyes when you're ready. How was that for you, Udi? Very relaxing. Was it? Good. Good. <laughs> good. Good. I'm glad. What was it that you found relaxing? Uh, the breathing mm -hmm. and just being grateful. Yeah. Thinking about all the things that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Something very relaxing about just focusing on not just sobriety, but. Um, mm -hmm. You know, things throughout the week that were 
grateful for things that we don't even realize that I didn't even realize like mm-hmm. that's true like roof over your head mm-hmm. uh, knowing that you have a secure meal yeah. every day yeah. I don't think about that mm-hmm. I just it's expect easy. it yeah it's easy for us to take it for granted yeah, yeah. so just knowing that I can go home yeah. and yeah. make something to eat. Yeah. It's yeah. very nice. Yeah. yeah. It's the same for me. It's very restful for me. Uh, it's almost like silencing everything else. That's why we started with that uh, breathing meditation. It's just kind of like quieting ourselves, quieting the day to day. I know you have a ton of stuff going on mm-hmm. for you right now, and I do too, to quiet ourselves and then just open up an invitation to ourselves to, to feel appreciation for our lives, mm-hmm. you know, for things that that uh, we might might not otherwise even pause to notice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What I'd like to do is take this exercise and tie it into this idea of holistic treatment. I said with a map, and the map that I'm looking at is going to be based in our experience right now. And I'm going to tie it in in just a second. Let me introduce uh, the work of Howard Gardner. He's a, a psychologist in the School of Education at Harvard University who's developed what's called a theory of multiple intelligences. This ties into that earlier quote by, by Albert Einstein, which I'm going to reread because I like it so much. <laughs> Eventually, I'll have it committed to memory. Einstein said, everybody is a genius. Howard Gardner would say, everybody has, uh, uh, he talks about multiple intelligences. Everybody has genius in at least one of these lines mm-hmm. of intelligence. We'll talk about them more. Everybody's a genius. Albert Einstein says, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Is that we're not good at everything, are we? And so let's talk a little bit about that. Howard Gardner talked about different lines of intelligence. And I I think he he talked about, it's really quite infinite, but I think he talked about like 24 different kinds of intelligence. And we'll just Mm -hmm. talk about the more common sense for just a second. (laughs) When, when, when you think of an intelligence test, like in this context of school, what do you think of? Do you mind if I ask? What an IQ you, test. Yeah, like an IQ test. Yeah. And what do you think it's testing? Just what's your, what's your thought about what it's testing? I'd say the ability to... Like what, how quickly you can come up with a, a good answer mm-hmm. or just how knowledgeable you are. Yeah, yeah. Just in general. Yeah. I, yeah. When I started graduate school all those years ago and we, we had courses just on intelligence testing, I remember the most common definition is the one you just gave. It was, it's very close to it, speed of information processing, hmm. your ability to generate answers right. to your language, language and to do it quickly. And I remember being puzzled by that definition because it <laughs> seems like to me one could be really fast at information processing but not very profound. Right. <laughs> And so in my mind, I used to think, I think I want to add depth to that, speed yeah. and depth. I don't think there's anything wrong with speed. No, it's nice to be able to sure access not. information, if possible, uh, as quickly as you can. Mm-hmm. But the depth dimension gets lost if that's all we're focused mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. And so you're absolutely right. The, an IQ test, at, at, at the intelligence quotient, uh, that's what that stands for, is, is really measuring a certain kind of intelligence, and it happens mm. to be the kind of intelligence that's rewarded in academics. Mm. So it'll look at your ability to use language, it'll look at your ability to work with numbers, mathematics, mm. and those, if you score high on those scores on a test, chances are you may be able to score high in school. Mm. So I think of that as just academic intelligence, and it's, it's good and it's important, but it's not the be all and end all. Right. And what I love about Howard Gardner's theory is he introduces other kinds of intelligence Um, uh, and draws those in. There's been a lot of work done in the last 30 years. Daniel Goldman's the big name in this of emotional intelligence Mm -hmm. is that I may have a lot of book smarts but not have much emotional intelligence to know how to interact with you as a person. In fact, there's a lot of research that's been done across business schools uh, in the country Mm -hmm. and they've found that that traditional academic IQ does not correlate with success in the business Mm -hmm. world nearly as much as emotional intelligence. Being able to read people, read your own feelings, be able to work with people, to get them on your side, work with teams, right. all of that is hard to learn out of a book. Oh, yeah. That reminds me of, uh, speaking about books, <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I read, I don't know if you heard Think and Grow Rich. Yeah, yeah, I did. I, my, my father loved that book and had me read that. I did read that. I like okay. it a lot. Yeah. That reminds yeah. me of uh, uh, Napoleon Hill 
talks about a story in that of I think it was Henry Ford or something mm-hmm. like that. They I think he was being sued. I'm probably butchering the story, but somewhere mm-hmm. along the lines that uh, Henry Ford was being sued. Okay. And they were they wanted to test his intelligence. Okay. Intelligence. Okay. And so the per, the persecutor was basically giving him uh, an educational uh, test or an okay. intelligence yeah. test. Yeah. Uh, but Henry Ford kind of stopped him and said, I don't know the answer to that question mm-hmm. because it has nothing to do with what we're on trial for. because uh, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. But it was basically going up against uh, mm-hmm. how he thinks um, not a... On, an intelligent level but an emotional level so yeah. pretty much saying that yeah. they were trying to do something where it had nothing to do with the intellectual side but more of the emotional yeah. side yeah. or yeah. something like that yeah yeah i, I, I don't know his story i love right. I, I love you bringing that in my guess is that he had a tremendous amount of emotional intelligence oh absolutely uh, it, it, it's right up next to what's sometimes called social intelligence i even think of emotional and social intelligence as being right next to each other. Mm-hmm. I want to recommend Daniel Goleman again. He's written several books on both. I've read several of his books on both emotional and social intelligence, and it's clear mm-hmm. that that uh, these pioneers, whether it's in the business world or other domains in life, right. may have way more emotional intelligence mm-hmm. than so-called academic intelligence. Yeah. When I brought this up today in the group, people talked about common sense or even street smarts. Mm-hmm. Is that that's street the smart. stuff? That's the stuff that you learn by living, right. and uh, and paying attention. And it may not be out of a book at all. Right. Yeah. Uh, so g- good for academic intelligence, but mm-hmm. to also honor the fact that there's emotional and social intelligence. You might find this interesting. There's been a fair bit of work in recent years on what's referred to as spiritual intelligence, mm-hmm. which is looking at somebody's capacity to carry depth and compassion mm. and a sense of, of the transcendent. Mm-hmm. And so spiritual intelligence would be another kind of intelligence. Right. Howard Gardner talks about two or three other kinds that are interesting to me. One, because my background is a musician, he mm-hmm. talks about musical intelligence as a people differ in terms of musical intelligence. Yeah. I've known people, for example, that play one instrument, and because they have so much musical intelligence, you could introduce them to another instrument today, and by tomorrow they will have mastered it. Right. I mean, they're that, yeah. that good. Mm. So musical intelligence, <laughs> and you probably have this story in your life. Yeah. He actually talks about people that have this ability with athletics. Mm. And so he talks about athletic or kinesthetic intelligence, basically mm. in your coordination and in your body. Right. And so I know dancers and I've known athletes for sure that were the same way. It'd be crazy. They'd be a really good basketball player. And think, in fact, I'm thinking of a friend of mine in high school who was a really good tennis player. Mm. And he, he went out for the football team his senior year. He was the quarterback. He was like the best quarterback imaginable. <laughs> he never had played. He didn't play. He didn't play. Uh, the first three years of high school, didn't play football. Right. He was just really good at tennis. Happened to be really good at football, too. And so there's kinesthetic intelligence. You can yeah. think of it that way. And there's another one that I always like. I don't have this intelligence. <laughs> uh, Howard Gardner talks about culinary intelligence. Mm. Some people are really able to cook with genius, mm. you know. And, uh, That's interesting. And so if you imagine 24 such intelligences as being suggestive and that there are many more than that, it gets us in the ballpark of me not holding you accountable. Let's say that you're a really good musician, Mm -hmm. but not such a good athlete. And let's say the opposite for me. Let's just say, well, how would it be fair for me to judge you on something you're not good at Mm -hmm. and not pay attention to what you are good at? It's back to that fish in the tree type of thing. Fish don't climb trees, so don't judge them for their tree climbing ability. They can do a really doggone good job of navigating through water. (laughs) That's 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 what they should be focused on. Right. So what I wanted to do in the context of talking uh, about holistic treatment today, mm-hmm. and we're going to wind down with this, but I'm going to give you a homework assignment if you're watching in today, is I've picked five types of intelligence that I think will make some sense to you. And you can examine yourself for where you're good at in these areas. Mm-hmm. And also maybe, in honesty, examine where you'd like to work on building up some of these strengths. Mm-hmm. And ask us that we would pay attention to each one of these five uh, kinds of intelligence, or they're sometimes called developmental lines. We develop across these various lines of intelligence over our lifetimes. I'm going to call the first one body intelligence. Mm -hmm. And that might be very closely related, among other things, to what a gardener is calling kinesthetic intelligence or even athletic intelligence. But I'd like to open that up into thinking of how we can be intelligent with our bodies. You remember mm-hmm. in the Gratitudes, we spent all that time talking about things like exercise and 
what we eat and mm -hmm. sleeping and certainly sobriety, even ways of self-calming. All of those things represent, mm -hmm. in my way of understanding it, ways that we can attend to our body and increase our body intelligence. And right. so what can I do today? What can I do this week to uh, address some area that I'd like to strengthen in my life? Mm -hmm. And also to acknowledge areas that are strong for me. I've just told you that I get up most every morning and I meditate. I get up most every morning and I exercise. I could do better with my diet. <laughs> okay, so let's work on that, okay? Definitely help. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> let's, just taking that on as a challenge. And we're talking about kind of a holistic approach to how do we, how do we honor our, ourselves. Body, mind, spirit. We'll talk about soul in just mm -hmm. a minute. We'll even talk about shadow. Let's talk about mind for just a second. Okay. What can I do to cultivate what we talked about earlier in terms of being able to process information. What can we do to cultivate our minds? I recommend reading good stuff. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and good reading at this point is includes watching YouTube videos that are of quality material, for example. Mm -hmm. Watching watching programs that help develop our intelligence. I feel like I've got a responsibility always to be building that. Yeah. I've had two or three different people this week ask me, Bob, would you have recommendations? For good books to read on addiction, good resources for mm. addiction, I'm gonna hap I'm happy to share those with you today in the audience. These are three that I think are the best, and I recommend these widely. One, if you have an interest to understand addiction yourself, or you have a loved one and you want to understand their addiction, I highly recommend uh, "In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts" by Gabor Mate, M-A-T-E. He's a, a physician out of uh, Vancouver, Canada and is incredibly literate, talking about addiction in a way that's compassionate and intelligent. Mm -hmm. I also highly recommend the DVD uh, series by Kevin McCauley. He's another physician, M-C-C-A-U-L-E-Y. His, his first uh, one is Pleasure Unwoven. His second one is Memo to Self. These are also the clearest explanations of addiction imaginable. Mm -hmm. You can order those online and I don't get any kickback. <laughs> and the, th the third recommendation I've mentioned here before is Thad Polk, P-O-L-K. He's a professor of uh, uh, physiological psychology at University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. He explains what happens to the brain in addiction better than anybody I know. And he has a lecture series that you can order online that's probably 15 lectures that are so clear and understandable. I tell you, I review that material because it's it there's no end to kind of developing understanding. And so whatever your areas of interest are, right. that we would commit to doing that. Um, so academic intelligence or IQ is part of this, calling it the mind. How about, um, let's talk about the soul. I do think of the soul this way. I've mm -hmm. uh, been very influenced by the psychology, the writings of Carl Jung, and particularly one of his prized students, James Hillman, who talked about the soul in terms of creativity. Mm. It's the part of us that is inspired. I think it is related to uh, issues of spirituality and faith. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about spirit in just a moment. I think of soul as embodying more of the creative impulse. What am I doing to exercise creativity right now? I talked to somebody this morning who said he's going to start taking a class in his local high school in French. Hmm. Just create a new skill. Create a new yeah. skill. I've just started a course on piano. <laughs> it's an online course, and I'm not a great pianist, but I'm going to be better at it. It's just like, <laughs> why not? Years ago, I read a book called Zen Without Zen Masters, and the author was saying, why not take whatever you do that's routine? Mm -hmm. For example, I'm assuming that you and I both shave. I see you shave yeah. and I shave. He said, if you usually shave with your dominant hand, shave with your non-dominant mm -hmm. hand. But be careful. Yeah. <laughs> okay. If you drive, if you drive to work, if you drive to work one route every day, go on automatic pilot. Drive a non-automatic way. Drive a different way. Just mm -hmm. kind of stir things up. So ways that we can create a new every mm -hmm. day. It's what one author calls beginner's mind. How can I have newness or beginner's right. mind like a child has? I do that uh, with brushing my teeth. Oh, good so for you. I, what do you do? I did this a while back, and I've been doing it since, but. Just one day, it just hit me. I was I was doing this, and I think I was thinking about like my mental health and just mm -hmm. how, like, hmm, I know that you need to do different things for your mind to yeah. uh, be healthy or whatever. So I said, I'm going to start brushing my teeth with my left hand. Very good. But it's an ele electric toothbrush, so okay. it's a lot easier. So you just kind of just it still requires coordination. I mean, it wasn't natural at the beginning. No, it's <laughs> not. But now I'm just like mm, I can do other stuff with my other hand while I'm brushing with my left. Very good. It's as simple as that. Yeah, yeah I like that. Keeping things new. 
Um, let's talk about spiritual intelligence. If that's okay. if if soul might be tied to what we would call creative intelligence, how do I keep my creativity? How do I keep that line moving forward? Spiritual intelligence. I think about this. I think some of the self help uh, uh, support programs in recovery are very helpful. We've both been involved in support yeah. groups where there's an emphasis on altruism, caring mm -hmm. for others. Mm -hmm. There's also an emphasis on compassion, mm -hmm. both for others and ourselves. Yep. And as well as there's an emphasis on prayer and meditation yeah. in most of these programs. And so just ways of developing that sense of spirituality, of being embedded, being connected to one another and being connected to something greater than we are, mm -hmm. whatever form that takes for someone. Yeah. I'd like to finish by talking about social and emotional intelligence, and I want to talk about this in, in, in terms of the way that Carl Jung, the psychiatrist, talked about this. He talked about d working on our shadow, mm. and you and I both have been involved in self-help support groups where there's a lot of work on your less glamorous parts. Right. We're working on, that's really working on our shadow. Mm -hmm. We've talked about shadow here before, but it typically has an emotional root, and it's also a shadow because we hide it from others socially. Mm. And so anything I can do to be examining kind of my leading edge in terms of my psychological and spiritual work, that would go under this category of, of working on my shadow, or maybe talk about it in terms of building emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. I want to reference uh, 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 several of our podcasts that we have done, and you can look them up, that have dealt with forgiveness practice. That's one form that we've talked about, which, which is a way that if I've wronged you, that I ask you for forgiveness in terms of a meditation. Mm -hmm. I also, if you've wronged me, I extend forgiveness to you. Mm -hmm. And then the third part of that is that whatever I've done to wrong you, that I come to an understanding of why I did that. I make a, a, a conscious effort to change mm -hmm. and I forgive myself. Mm -hmm. And so that process is cultivating that shadow material. So that's one approach for sure that you can take that, that we've done here in a number of episodes. So I recommend you to those episodes on forgiveness practice. Mm -hmm. I also recommend uh, therapy and coaching. This is really this yeah. is really what therapists and counselors and coaches do is, is help individuals to work on those things that are hard to see themselves and do it, back to this earlier comment, do it in an environment that is uh, that is safe, yeah. that there's safety. Mm. So your homework is this week. I want you to pick one goal for each one of these intelligences or each one of these developmental lines. So let's review them. Body, what can I do for my body intelligence? Mind, what can I do to develop my mind? Soul, what can I do to develop my creativity? Mm. I also brush with both hands. Nice. Well, you're <laughs> a drummer. That's a lot well, easier. That's unfair, right? Yeah, okay. that's super unfair. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, creativity or creative intelligence, dealing with soul, spiritual intelligence. What are ways that I can stretch to uh, to notice beauty and to render uh, uh, kindnesses to others? Mm -hmm. And then finally, what can I do to work on my social and emotional intelligence by addressing shadow? Mm -hmm. So this, these will keep us busy. I, I, there's a phrase that uh, John F. Kennedy used uh, that a rising tide will lift all boats. My view is that mm -hmm. any investment I make in any one of these developmental lines affects the other ones positively. Mm -hmm. And for me being in recovery and for you too, anything that we can do to build ourselves and to grow, I feel like is uh, moving in a positive direction yeah. in support of our recovery. Would you say, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead of you, will talk about this some other time, but you can tell me if you are. Mm. Is it would you say beneficial to really hone in and focus on just one of these intelligence or is it, question. is it good to kind of do everything at once? Uh, the way that Carl Jung talked about it's a good question. Yeah. I have thought about this a lot. Yeah. Per I've thought about this personally as well as in, in my uh, uh, counseling or mm -hmm. coaching work. Carl Jung talked about this is that he said, be sure to work on your inferior functions. Mm. So there may be some areas that are particularly inferior. Right. Uh, if we go back to the musician athlete, ath athletic example, mm -hmm. if music is your inferior function, then he'd say, then by all means don't neglect that. Mm. And so for sure, anything that feels like it's undeveloped, if you've never done shadow work, mm -hmm. then you might want to put a lot of emphasis in that. Mm. Having said that, Carl Jung and others for sure, and it certainly would fit with the spirit of what I just shared here, is that there's value to making sure that we're balanced across areas. And I'll tell you how it goes for me. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit of a geek this way, mm -hmm. and I'm going to acknowledge that on camera. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. But starting back in graduate school, I've tracked these things in various ways. I don't do it right now these days, but I have. For I'll, I'll track body, mind, spirit, soul, and shadow. 
or some version of that, and I'll, I'll actually track it. And I've done this, this is a little embarrassing to share, but it just keeps me honest, is I just, I'll track it. And if, if any time that I give like a half hour to working out or a half hour to building my mind or a half hour to learning piano, mm. I've, I've actually kept track of it in my calendar, noticing that what I do notice is that it waxes and wanes. There'll be a period of time, like right now, exercising is on automatic pilot for me. Mm -hmm. Check with me in a year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 How's it going with that, Bob? Because the fact of the matter is, in a year, I may be like a piano madman, right. which would be fine, but I'm not working out. Mm. And so just some way to gently kind of keep ourselves uh, uh, aware of, mm -hmm. of how that kind of ebbs and flows. Mm. If you know that some things are a done deal, I don't know your routine, and mm. you have some sense of mind. If some things pretty much take care of themselves, then there's less focus on those. And so mm -hmm. let me work on the things that, that are less obvious to me. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you right now, the one for me that probably hits home the closest, I don't ever have a problem, just historically, on, on the one about mind. Because mm -hmm. I, I read so much. Right. I read so much. So it's like I don't spend a lot of time thinking, well, boy, I better be building that one because I'm constantly reading material. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you that all the other ones have, is, have been striking to me. It's no accident that I said right now, I'm working on some piano lessons mm -hmm. because that soul creative dimension is one that I'm noticing I'm paying less attention to right now. Mm -hmm. It's one thing when I'm active musically and I have a band, but I've been limited because of two shoulder surgeries. Mm -hmm. I've been limited, and that's kind of language, so I'm not really composing right now. I'm not drumming um, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, as much as I'd like. And so it's like that one gets my attention. So at least some way to keep an eye. I've picked five lines here just basically because they're very traditional you know, body, mind, soul, spirit, and I've thrown in shadow, right. those five. There are others that you might want to work on. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about cooking. We talked about athletics and so on. There are other ones. But I think it's important that all of those be uh, kept in balance, and mm -hmm. I think that that's consistent with the literature. So okay. um, if you're really deficient in one, then go for that one, but, yeah. but not at the neglect of the others. Uh, uh, we've all known people yeah. that are really, really smart mm -hmm. and really, really lacking in emotional sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Uh, yep. or I've known people that are very, very creative and not in their bodies at all, mm. really have neglected their bodies. Right. And so that's the way it can go. We have to be really careful about that, to that's not over-accentuate some strengths at the expense of everything else. Yeah, I like how you put it, too, beforehand, that uh, it's good to know that just balancing or at least just maybe focus on one for a little bit, how everything else will probably, well, not probably, but will cascade into yeah, each other. Yeah, this idea of a rising tide lifts yeah. all boats. That is my experience. Yeah, I know that when I take care of myself, for example, physically, mm -hmm. and I'm eating well and resting, it, it covers a multitude of sins. Right, it, yeah. it, 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 there's a lot that gets in order in my life that way. Mm -hmm. In fact, I talked about it this way, is that for any of us that are in recovery, sobriety is not a given, mm -hmm. and I feel like sobriety is foundational. Yeah. In terms of t in those, early, those early gratitudes that we had about our body, sleeping, eating, sobriety, and so on, I feel like those are foundational for everything else. If I take care of my body, mm -hmm. that's a good start for my being able to be more, able to be present for you emotionally, or right. be sharper mentally, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, I think that, the, I feel like that you and I aren't separated in all these categories. We are body, we are mind, mm -hmm. We are soul, we are spirit, we're all of these things. And so it's kind of artificial to say, we're just going to work on this part. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, it's like, we're going to work on this arm yeah. and not that one. Yeah. It's not the way it works. Yeah. Yeah. All right, yes. you guys, we're going to wrap up for right now. I just want to finish as we have in recent times. There is always hope for all of us, right? And today I want to say there's hope for us in being able to build upon our strengths. Today mm -hmm. we're really focused on positive psychology, a strengths orientation, focusing on building your assets, and we're talking mm -hmm. about building up these strengths even to be uh, even more balanced in our lives. So yeah. I hope you find it helpful. I hope you'll do the homework or at least give it a try, okay? <laughs> and uh, come back and join us next week. We're looking forward to being back next week. We've, we've been talking about social intelligence. We're going to be looking at the social line next week, talking about shame as how it locates in interpersonal relationships. Mm -hmm. We'll be talking about, uh, in fact, we'll talk about shame as a, as a social emotion. So come back and join us for that next week, and uh, maybe we'll check in to see how your homework went, okay? <laughs> if you have any final questions, feel free to write uh, me. At my, my website is uh, drbobweathers.com. You can write Austin through Beginnings Treatment Centers uh, uh, or Ask Addiction Specialist, the, the uh, Facebook group. 
um, and also on YouTube. So there's lots of ways to, to get to us. Several of you have written questions to me in the last few weeks, and I appreciate that. I'd love to respond to you. So feel free to extend. Uh, you, can let, you can let me know, and I'll let it, Odie know how you're doing with your homework, okay? <laughs> I want to thank you for joining us. So Odie, thanks for joining today. Thank you for yeah, yeah, me, it's as great, great having you. Uh, thank you, Austin. And, thank uh, you, Austin. You all have a very good week, okay? Take care. We'll see you next Wednesday.